All right, welcome back to another episode. Today we will be interviewing Hugo the dog. No, we have a special guest, of course, the owner and uh, head. I don't know if we want to call you head coach anymore. I think head trainer, I think, is uh, okay. more am suitable. I been, have I been demoted? <laughs> been demoted, yeah. Based off what we're going to talk about today, he's been demoted. Been so demoted. head coach and owner at Cross Release Summit here, Mr. Aaron Axman. Aaron, thanks for coming on, man. Thanks for having me. Uh, Aaron, I don't know if he was forced into this. You know, we're, we may get into that answer here, gun, hopefully. Gun to the head. Gun to the head here. Yep. But he recently took a stab at the Ozark Trail 100 mile endurance run, run slash Ultimate walks. Yeah. You, you crazy man. <laughs> Something like that. Yeah. So, we're going to kind of talk about four things with him today. Like, first off, why on earth would someone do this? Right. Two, what was the, the, prep, uh, the prep like for the run? And three, his experience during the run. And then, of course, uh, the aftermath. And that whole experience right. that he went through. So, so if you're thinking about doing a marathon, or maybe you are going to be starting a training for a hundred mile endurance run, Aaron's probably got some pretty good uh, insight for you on uh, how to train for one. I can help you out. What yeah. you're going to feel like <laughs> during wise and afterwards, and maybe some things that he might change. So, right. so let's get into it right off the bat here. Why on earth? would you want to do this race? That's a great question. Um, so my journey into ultra running started uh, over a year ago when I had a shoulder surgery um, and I just kind of thought it needed something to uh, keep me away from my normal way of training for a little while so I could let that shoulder heal properly. And I wanted to be able to train for something, but right. I didn't want to do like a a marathon. I would want to, like I knew I could run a marathon. I knew I could run a 50k, things like that. Right. So I wanted to make it something that there was a chance I wouldn't finish, right? Like make it hard enough that you may fail because like there's no reason just to pick something that you know you can accomplish. So right? you're looking for something yes, physically challenged but yeah. maybe something to mentally keep Right, you right. Yeah, definitely more of the uh, I mean it was obviously hugely physical, but at the same time I think it was a lot more between the ears than um than than the physical side of it you it, but at the same time like yeah obviously it's both um but that was kind of how i came to that um decision and um and to give you a little background I'm not a runner i ran track in high school but i was like a middle distance guy i'd never really been an endurance athlete um was considered myself a barbell athlete beforehand had never signed up for an organized race before this one um <laughs> he's never uh, ran for political office he's gonna run for president right. 2020 next, next year yeah, 2020 <laughs> yeah i have no political experience whatsoever no none, uh, none. i'll be great though um but anyway so that was it, like in a nutshell. And then also like a few years, maybe before that, I'd seen a documentary on Netflix about the, the Barkley Marathon or Marathon. What is that? Uh, so it's a race that's ran in Tennessee and it's considered to be one of like the hardest ultra marathons in the world. It's a um, hundred plus miles through this frozen head state park. And these people do multiple 20 mile loops clockwise, counterclockwise through the night. Um, they get 12 hours to complete 20 miles at a time. And every time you do it, you can go on again oh, okay. or you can, you can tap out and they, and it's, it's, it, it's gained a bunch of popularity in the ultra running community. Um, and I saw this on TV and I'm like, I want to do it. But the thing is, in order to be able to do it, you have to prove that you can go long. You have to finish a hundred mile endurance run or ultra marathon beforehand to even be considered if you put an application in. And so, you know, through research and things like that, uh, some people said, if you're going to try to put an application in for the Barkley, you need to do this race in, in the Ozark Mountains in, mm -hmm. in Missouri. And, uh, and so that was essentially one of the reasons why I chose this one, what kind of led me down that path more, as well as the shoulder. Um, after doing it, I don't know that I really care to do the Barkley. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because... That was hard, and watching the documentary on the yeah. Barkley, like you're Seems like, like a oh, big step up. Oh, the what those men and women go through attempting that is, uh, it, it looks like just pure torture. So, what was the reaction of friends and family and the CrossFit community when you told them you were going to do this race? You know, I think most people were. I mean, everybody was super supportive. I I never really felt like anybody was uh, was negative about it. Um, you know, I think a lot of people probably thought initially I was just just BSing. You crazy man. 
I was like, oh, I'm going to do this hundred mile race, and then a couple months later, after the shoulder feels better, they're going to they're going to quit. Like, going to quit. I'd be like, oh no, I was just kidding, yeah, yeah. you know. But like, I'm not like that. I, I I really wanted to I really wanted to give it a shot, kind of see what I was made of mentally and physically, and uh, and um, you know, personal growth type of stuff, a little uh, uh, personal exploration, see what see how deep your rabbit hole goes. Right, so, right, yeah. So let's talk about your preparation for this run. So you do pretty much the majority of our programming here at CrossFit. So right. you've got a background and you mentioned barbell sports. You don't have much of a background in preparing for an endurance race. No. How did you prepare and how, where did you get your knowledge from? Well, I mean, like anybody, I just Googled. I mean, I just got on the internet and started researching different training programs. Um, you know, there's a plethora of information out there for anybody that wants to run, you know, do their half marathon, uh, first half marathon, marathon, things like that. There's also plenty of information out there about running ultras. Um, and so I found a training program that looked, it was a, it was a six month training program. Um, I had already started obviously the six months leading up to that, like just increasing distance over time, going out and running nine, 10, 15, 20, you know, whatever mileage. Um, and then uh, when the six month mark came about, I started following this online training program and it basically went like this. You ran Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, you rested on Mondays and Fridays, and then you ran on Saturdays and Sundays. And everything in the middle of the week was kind of short and medium. And then the Saturday was a long run and the Sunday was like a medium run. And right. you always followed up your long run with a medium run. Um, and then it was basically just, you know, trail running because the race was going to be on trails. So I spent almost six months of my life out at Jacomo, Lake Jacomo, running trails out there, which you know, they're, they're tech, they're mostly mountain biking trails. So really technical, lots of like bobbing and weaving, not a lot of like straight shot running, which is sucks because sometimes to accumulate the miles, it's just nice to be able to right. just keep going. And so that was it. It was just a, a ton of running. I still tried to do some strength work in here, um, just to kind of keep some muscle mass, but I knew I was going to, um, lose a lot. So yeah, and over the course of it, I lost 20 pounds um, five inches on my quads, uh, went from about 215 to 195 and, um, pretty much ruined one knee. <laughs> <laughs> Yay, no, running! <laughs> no, nah, I mean, you know, it's, uh, it was already, it was already kind of messed up in the beforehand, but yeah, yay so, running. <laughs> so what was the hardest part of your preparation? You know, knowing every Saturday morning, um, especially in the summertime that it's, you know, 90 plus degrees in, in the Midwest and you've got to get up at like four o'clock in the morning and go out and try to get some miles done before, um, before that heat and humidity really sets in. And just knowing that every week, you know, every Saturday was that, and just trying to wrap your mind around those distances when, you know, the longest run I'd ever done before any of this was maybe 15 miles. And when I was in high school, Wow. you know, so like, um, you know, going from running a, a 10 to 15 mile run, and then all of a sudden you're running 25s and 30s. Uh, it's just, it, you know, it's scary. Um, and being out there alone a lot of the times by yourself, uh, middle of the woods, you know, it's just, you know, it's never know. What would you change about your preparation? Well, uh, I think I would just, uh, on longer days, really focus on not the mileage, mo focusing on time, um, which is what my program that I followed said, it was like, don't worry about how many miles you're accumulating as much as the amount of hours you're spending on your feet. Because when it comes down to it, to run a hundred miles, um, it's all about what your body can tolerate, right. like it, physically. Um, I think the mental side of it, the majority of people that already run ultra marathons, like they're already mentally tough. Like they're, they know that shit's going to hurt. And it's just the way it is. And you've already wrapped your mind around that part of it. But if your body just can't physically do it, um, then you didn't prepare properly. And I just, that was where I fell short. So, yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about your experience during the race. Okay. So sure. why don't you, for people who don't know anything about the race, why don't you give us kind of the layout, how it exactly works? Right. Um, so in that particular race, um, they start, you start at the finish line and they they bus you to the start line or they, or you, or you can take a car or somebody can drive you down there. But since it was my first one and you have to be there really early in the morning, it's dark, it's middle of the woods, it's Ozarks, Missouri, which is the roads are windy. And, um, I rode the bus down. And so they drop you off at the start line, South side of the woods. And you just start running it when they say go. And, 
And uh, as far as the terrain goes there, it is a lot of climbing um, and a lot of descending and a lot of water crossings. And that's just pretty much what it is for 100 miles. Climb, run some flats, run some downhills, cross water, climb, run some flats, <laughs> run some downhills, cross water. So your and, shoes and your feet have got to be getting wet. Yep, always. Yeah, there's no way. I mean, you know, there's, there's some ways you could keep them dry, but you're going to sacrifice time. I actually took some big, um, like... Tra trash compactor garbage bags to pull up over my legs and try to cross these. And I just didn't end up wasting the time to get them out of my pack. Um, and I honestly wish I would have it about the, right before the mile 65 aid station because uh, it was 24 degrees outside and crossing water and getting your shit. And it was knee deep. Yeah. And you're just, your teeth are chattering. It was so cold. But, um, but anyway, so that that's the extent of it. I mean, it's just the the terrain is tough. Um, the trail was covered in leaves. You can't see the rocks, the sticks. You basically run on top of acorns for 100 miles, which if you don't have the proper footwear, um, if you don't have some cushiony soles. You're you, you talked about that. Maybe you would have worn different footwear. What would you, what would you have changed? So I, I wore uh, two pairs of shoes, and they're both a brand called Ultras. And one is an Ultra Lone Peak, and one is an Ultra Superior. And the only thing I think would have maybe benefited me more, um, especially not getting the training, like the hours on my feet that I needed to do this properly, was just something with more cushion. Uh, more of a maximalist style shoe would have been maybe, you know, easier on the knees and ankles. The acorns wouldn't have beat the crap out of the bottoms of my feet so bad, which by the end of it, I didn't have any blisters or anything on the bottoms of the feet, but they were pretty sore. Um, and so I think I would have gone to maybe more like a Brooks Cascadia, which is a thicker, more rugged shoe or like right. a Hoka. Um, but I didn't know. And I ran in the ultras all summer long and they just did me well out here, but totally different terrain down so there what other gear did you need or would you suggest for doing a run like this well you got you're gonna have to have something to carry water i had a what would be a, they call a hydration vest um and the reason it's not like a backpack and it's a vest is because the vest fits tighter on you so as you run it doesn't bounce right because that bouncing creates wear and friction right. and you get all these you get weird spots rubbing on you so um if somebody's going to do something like that get it get some sort of hydration vest mine held a bladder in the back and had spots for water bottles in the front i just carried water in the bladder and one bottle for water in the front so i could put like electrolytes in it yeah. um I don't really particularly like the water bottles in the front, but some people, that's all they carried. Some people had them where they carry them in the back. There's so many different styles out there, but that's a must. You just, and you got to carry uh, calories with you. Yeah. Like if you're not, the one thing that the guy told me early on in the race, he says, this is an eating contest with running in it. And that's the <laughs> truth. If you can't put calories in every hour on the hour, no way you're going to so finish what, it. What were you eating out there? It, it, it varied all over the place from, you know, a lot, all the aid stations that you come to, they all have food. Um, you're carrying with you protein bars and like um, higher carbohydrate uh, supplements like um, energy chews and things that are giving you a couple hundred calories of carbs um, and usually some electrolytes, potassium, sodium um, or potassium and magnesium and calcium and things like that. And then uh, magnesium. Um, but like the thing I found, the things I found to that that did me better or made me feel better faster were oranges and potato soup. Um, potato soup, why potato soup? That's just what they had it. Then as it got dark and cold, the potato soup was warm. Um, the starches from the potatoes were easily <sighs> absorbable and digestible. Um, it didn't sit heavy in your gut. Your body just got it in quick. The oranges, obviously, the sugar, the glucose from the oranges. Um, and they're just things that don't upset your stomach. Um, because I did eat some things at different aid stations where you leave the aid station and 30 minutes later, you're just like, oh, shit, that was. Oh, a, man, it's going to be nothing worse than that running was a mistake. with like a cramp yeah. or. Not a cramp, but more so just bubble gut. Yeah. Like gas and like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like so much crap going through your mind and you're like, and now I'm just, now I'm super gassy and my guts feel like they're this big. Um, so learned a lot about that because I obviously in my training, I ate while I ran. Right. To try to make sure that I was acclimated to it. But. You know, you come into these aid stations and they've got Oreos and potato chips and they've got all sorts of sweet, sugary things. Mm -hmm. Right. And you th and they sound good and you think that you want them because it's instant energy. But, man, it just some of that stuff just doesn't sit well in your stomach. So. So the big question I think most people are probably thinking about when they're doing a race like this is what is the pain level going to be like during the race? It's all over the place. Um, you know, there's parts of it where 
you're good. You're mentally good. You're physically good. Everything feels like it's a well-oiled machine. And then it changes so fast and it just depends on the terrain. I mean, I, I remember leaving one aid station at like maybe mile like 31 or 30 something. And you kind of go up this field driveway and you cross this road and you jump back onto the trail and you're just like this, you're just like, Oh shit. The trail just goes, you know, and you start climbing and you feel like you're climbing for an hour and everything down the backside of your legs is screaming. And, and you, I mean, and you're just hiking and you're thinking to yourself, I'm just hiking. Why when I want to keep going, you know? And so uh, uh, like just muscular fatigue pain, the level gets pretty high. Um, and then if you have breakdown, like I had in my ankles, like that just got unbearable to the point where, you know, you know, you can keep going, but at what cost? Right. And that's really where it eventually ends up being uh, the choice to either quit or, or end up needing a surgery or something at the end of it, right? But um, the wouldn't, roller coaster wouldn't that, wouldn't that be bad? You, you left a shoulder surgery, you right. wanted to avoid it, right? And then you end up getting another right. surgery. Because yeah, of the not race. worth it. Totally right. not worth it. Um, but the the emotional roller coaster that you ride through something like that is I don't know that you can really prepare for it um, without just going and doing a race like this because you're there's so many highs and lows where you're. In your mind, you're just like, all right, I'm just going to roll into this next aid station and I'm calling it quits. And like that little voice in your mind is telling you, it's okay. It's okay to quit. Nobody's going to judge you. You made it X amount of miles. It's respectable. But you get into the aid station, get some food in your system, and you're like, ah, it's only whatever time in the afternoon. I can keep going. And you get out and all of a sudden that glucose hits your bloodstream and you're like, what was I thinking? I, I'm going to finish this thing, you know, and you ride, you ride that roller coaster the entire time. Um, and, and it's just keep pushing that little voice down and, and telling it to shut the F up, man. Like, that's all it's about. Like, I, I, again, commend these people that, that finished, holy crap. Um, some mentally tough individuals. So what you, you made it 40 miles by yourself. Okay. Then you ran with your brother, Adam, he came on for 25 miles. So you did a total of 65 miles. What was your mentality like after finishing those 65 I'm disappointed, you know, like I, at 40, when we left mile, the uh, aid station at mile 40, I really, really thought I was finishing. Like I felt pretty good. My pace wasn't super slow. We were, I was still able to run and hike, run and hike, run and hike. Um, I had figured out how to hydrate, you know, you just get the timing of it down when you need to take in hydration. Right. Um, the food thing had been, I'd gotten that figured out. Like I felt really good. I was putting in calories. They weren't killing my guts. Um, physically I was tired, but I wasn't destroyed. And then, and then to get, you know, to that point where you're just like, I can't keep going and you have to pull out of it. And, uh, yeah, somewhat proud of myself for obviously doing 65, but super disappointed that I didn't, that I failed. You know, so like it's psychologically, it's tough. I think I'm still processing it. Like I'm not 100% good with it yet. I'm still contemplating going back next year and doing it again. Um, but at the wow. same, but at the same time, I'm like, really want to put those inches back on my quads <laughs> and like get strong again right. and and be a, a be a multimodality athlete, not just specialize in something because that specialization really is. It gets old. Right. It wears on you. Yeah. What, what would you change about how you ran the race? I... If anything. Yeah. I mean, like, now I think... Um, so, I ended up running with a guy that had done it before. And in my mind, I thought, this is going to be good. I need to use utilize somebody who's has experience doing this. And now looking back on it, I think it was really good that I did that. But at the same time, our paces were different. Like... I hiked faster than he did and I actually ran faster than he did typically. So his pace was a little slow for what I was used to, but at the same time, mentally you're like, well, I don't want to, I don't want to blow myself up and like not have the energy to finish. Um, but at the same time, less time on your feet is, is valuable as well. Mm -hmm. You know, like getting it done faster is valuable. So I I think I would have just ran my own race. Um, not anything against the guy I ran with, like, It was a, a really awesome experience. He gave me a ton of great advice and information that, you know, that I can give back to everybody else that's never done it before. But I think going after it again, I probably wouldn't buddy up with somebody. I'd probably just go run my own race. And well, and he's probably done, I don't know if he's done this He's race. done multiple ones. Yes. He'd done this one so before. So he knows his own pace. He knows, yeah, he'd, he'd done this race before a few years before. He'd done uh, multiple ultra marathons, 100 milers, stuff like that, um, you know, and 
And he even said it to me a couple times. He's like, hey, if I'm not moving the way you want, run your own race. Don't stick with me. And I'm like, no, I think this is good just because never done one before. Right. Um, and it was a game time decision. It was like, I'm going to stay with this guy because he's got experience. I don't. Um, it seemed to be very smart. But then looking back on it, it may have been a, a better uh, game plan for me to just go run my own race and, you know, I, I don't know that I would have made it any further. I may have dropped out earlier. Who knows? Yeah. But um, it would have. There would have been no question then. You know. So, um, not that I would blame his pace or any of that for me having to pull out of the race by any means. That was definitely not the case. It had everything to do with the fact that I got sick at the end of September. I missed out on three long weekends that I was supposed to run a 30 mile run and then follow it up with a 20 plus mile run the day after. And I wasn't able to do any of those because I had pneumonia and it just, but I, again, it's like, what do you do? You spend all this time training. You got to you you at least it, yeah. go try it with the, the knowledge that there's, it's not very probable that I was going to finish, you know? So, um, but I wanted to at least give it a go. So, so after the race, you, you, you kind of, I don't know. It kind of seemed like you kind of felt really not only disappointed for yourself, but you kind of felt disappointed for other people. You had some other people that were going to run with you and run the race with you that had been, that had been training along right, with you. Right. Talk about real quick, those emotions and that experience where they weren't able to, to right. run with you. in the race. Yeah. So I had three other pacers that were going to, um, going to put some miles in with me after I left Adam at 65, if I was going to continue. And, you know, those people have put in a big time commitment throughout the the, the summer and the beginning of the fall um, training so that they made sure they were they were physically ready for it. Um, they bought equipment for it, you know, things like that. So they made not only a time commitment, but a, but a financial commitment as well. And so, uh, you know, you just feel like you let them down and they did all that for nothing. Um, and it's tough because, like, you know, you they're, it's all on you. You're the one that, that is leading – leading the whole thing and um and not just that but this community of people who all watched me like go through a year of my life training for this thing and then to to not finish it was was kind of devastating psychologically but obviously you know it, you you learn just to accept the fact that you can't change it and right. and now all we can do is move forward and that's what i'm going to try to do and um figure out what's next i guess yeah so so you talked a little bit about what's next you may be going to be potentially running this race again at some point. <laughs> what is your training going to be like now? And, and what are your immediate training plans? Um, yeah, like, you know, I'm going to get back into just basic barbell strength work, squats, deadlifts, presses. Um, I would like to, I haven't really done any Olympic lifting since before my shoulder surgery. I'd like to get back to snatch and clean and jerk a little bit. And, uh, and I really want to focus on, uh, my gymnastics, handstand, walking, handstand, push-ups, um, strict ring muscle-ups, things like that. Just uh, start building that stability and control back that I once had um, and start becoming that like that, that total athlete again. And uh, so just CrossFit basically, but um, with some caveats to it, I guess. So, yeah. That's Good really deal, it. man. Yeah. Aaron. Anything else? That's it, man. Thanks yeah. for coming on, Matt, Matt, thanks for having me, buddy. Yeah, buddy. Appreciate, Appreciate it. it man.